So, let's uh, see what questions you have on 2.4. The library? Yep. 67? All right, 67 on 2.4. A mechanic is paid 12 bucks per hour for regular time, time and a half for overtime. The weekly wage function is, okay, and they give it to you in two pieces. The first one's real simple. 12 times the number of hours. Notice that's when H is between 0 and 40, number of hours. So if he just works a normal work week, <coughs> just gets paid 12 bucks an hour. Then for when H is above 40, here's the formula. 18 times H minus 40 plus 480. Okay, so the question is in part A, what's W of 30? Well, H is 30, so you're going to use which part of the piecewise was. Okay, no idea, huh? Uh, when they're giving you a number between 0 and 40, you use the top formula. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. So then you want to just, uh, on this one, what's W of 30? So in other words, what does he get paid if he works 30 hours? So use the top formula and just take 20 times... Excuse me, 12 times 30. So that's all you have to do for that one. Now, the second part, it goes on. It says, what's W of 40? Well, that still fits in the top formula, doesn't it? Liz? So that one's easy. What about W of 45? Well, now that, now you're in the above 40 range. Now you use the bottom formula. You literally plug in 45 in place of H, and just do the arithmetic. So, but the, the key thing is, you've got to watch. Which formula do I use? And the rule is off to the right side of that thing. It says when H is between 0 and 40, use the top formula. And when H is over 40, use the bottom formula. Is that not doing it for you? No, I just was making it harder. That's really all that this piecewise is trying to tell you. It's saying we either use formula one when you're within 40 hours, or if you go over 40 hours, here's how we'll calculate your salary. Yep. Yes. 39. Sketch the graph. So this is a norm. This is uh, okay. Yeah, do I have that library function on here? I do on the previous one. Oh, let's see, let's just open up a second one here. I, I wanted to pull up one of those graphs. So here it is. Okay, so here's here's the uh, this is not the answer. This is the normal greatest integer function. Now didn't they give you in 49 this one minus two? So what does that mean? It means every y coordinate is two less. So it's just literally each one of these we come down to this one we go I use red I can get this thing I don't know what's going on here Well, let's just try to do it manually. Okay, so we use red. That means, you know, this one would be right down here. Mm 
This one would be right here. I'm, I'm drawing crazy. It's because my pen is not working right now. This one here would be too lower, so this would be right here. So you're going to get the same step ladder, if you will, but it's what? It's just literally the whole thing is lowered. Or somebody might say, it looks to me like it's been shoved to the right. Yeah, it all depends on your point of view. That's the only time you got to be careful of your ringtone, right? When it goes off in public. <laughs> That's why I decided not to use the wild monkeys one that I have on my phone. Because I figured I could just see it. I'll be in chapel, and there'll be a really quiet moment in chapel. And then... <laughs> Math professor? What is he doing? Anyway, is that enough? So, I would keep going. Telling yeah, the the re because the minus two is outside of the parentheses, outside of the brackets, if you will, it's saying when you're all done getting your answer, which normally would be three up here, just subtract two from it. So all these y coordinates are now two lower. So it's like all the same points, but all the y coordinates are always two lower, and the result is everything has literally been shoved down. Units. Yeah, now that, okay, thank you. What's the difference when it's in the brackets? Now it's saying, take your value of x before, uh, and right away add 1 before you even calculate the greatest integer. So what that's going to do is take everything and shove it to the left. What? I'll do a different color. I'll do blue on this one, okay? Yeah, this thing, I don't know, it's somewhere out to lunch. Mm, now it's off. Ah, there we go. Okay, so now in blue, this is, so let me say in red, this is what? What was that? What number? 39? Now in blue, everything is 1 to the left. That's an open circle now. You get the idea. So let me just say then, when you're inside parentheses, the effect is 1 in the opposite direction. So with the plus 1, it's saying, well, yeah, you got to be 1 left to be the same. So it's, in effect, moving it 1 to the left. When you have something outside of parentheses, that's just doing a vertical up or down. And it's not reversed. So if it's a, like a minus 2, down 2. Plus 2, up 2. <coughs> That's correct. That is exactly correct. Okay. And the only other thing you have to remember is when you're inside the parentheses, it kind of goes opposite because the plus goes to the left. But when you're outside the parentheses, it's not. Minus means down, plus means up. Yeah, if you keep those two facts in mind, you've got you've got the idea. Yep. That was a good question. <clears throat> Somebody else? Thirty what? Thirty five, yes. G of three. Okay, so now that's you know, and this is uh, to kind of a the same kind of question Michelle had. Everybody, look at number thirty-five. What's going on with that? This is saying 
Well, we got all kinds of things going on. First of all, it says take every point you normally have and move it to the right too. And then multiply, you know. All right. First of all, let me ask you this. What does this mean in normal straight line talk? It says it's got a slope of 3 and it goes and it has a y intercept of 5. Okay. Now, what would happen if we did this? Well, that would be a step ladder because it's a step function again. But it would go up more steeply. Instead of going up the normal slope of 1, it's going to go up with a slope of 3. So the steps are going to go up more quickly like that. Well, then what happens when you do this? What was it, minus 2? Now, what happens in comparison to this one? The same thing, except this one is moved to the right, two units. So, that's just a general way to look at it. If you really want to, if you're really stuck, you can always just pick values of x and try them, can't you? You're going to have to take a bunch of them, though, aren't you? And you're going to get steps, and they're going to go up rather steeply from left to right. And... Uh, instead of going through the origin like they normally do, where is it going to go through? The point zero, uh, two zero, and, um, and then everything is going to be a little bit be higher because of this too. So it's going to whiff the origin this time. But you could always just crank away and try points. Yes. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, then all you got to do is substitute it. I'm sorry. You didn't have to graph it. Well, what you would do is plug in negative 2.7. So what's negative 2.7 minus 2? Negative 4.7. Now, what's the greatest integer of negative 4.7? Negative 5. What's 3 times negative 5? Negative 15. And what's negative 15 plus 5? Negative 10. So there's the answer to part A. Yeah. Sorry, I was. Yeah. I thought that was a graph. Okay. Anybody else question? Yes. Sixty-nine. The figure shows the volume of fluid in the tank as a function of the time. Okay. So obviously it goes up, then it goes down, and it goes back up again. All right, determine the combination of input and drain pipe. Oh, it's got an intake and it's got two drain pipes, doesn't it? Okay, so if it's going in at 10 gallons a minute, And two drain pipes at a flow rate of five gallons per minute each. Sounds to me like it's going to stay even, doesn't it? You've got ten coming in and two well, fives going in. That graph right there shows you how it's decreasing and changes. So, so you've got to kind of put it together to make an equation. So you just have to open and close. Ah, I gotcha. Okay, well, the key here is the slope. Uh, here, here's the deal. When it's uh, when you look at the first part of the graph from zero to from from the first point to the second point, what's the slope there? 50 minus zero over five minus uh, that's a slope of 10. So what does that mean? That means that it's coming in at a rate of 10. And you look at the figures and you go, oh, yeah, the input valve is wide open, and obviously the drain pipes are closed at that point, correct? Okay, now look at, so we're describing what's going on here. Now look at the second segment. From 550 to 1075, what's the slope? 25 over 5 or 5? So what does that mean? It's got to be coming in at a rate of 10, and then we must be losing 5. So that tells me that the input valve is still open, but one drain pipe is now open also in that segment. 
All right, then in the next segment, we got nothing going on. So what does that mean? It could mean two things. You might have the intake valve still open, and you might have both drains open, or you might have everything shut. Anyway, you would just keep going point by point, and you can you see how you can figure out the scenario. So the question was, yeah, that's we're, we're doing what they want us to do, and we would just keep. Going. So, but, but the key here is, why is it slope? Because slope is rate. Change. Change in y over change in x. Rate. And rate is what they're talking about when they say, when this valve is open, the water comes in at a rate of 10 whatever per minute. So, probably the only thing I had to tell you was slope. After that, you can kind of figure it out. Anybody, you know, I don't think there's any secrets like there's no two and a halves. And then you have to say, well, well, yeah, the, uh, the drain was half open. No, I don't think they did any of that horsing around. It was either open or closed. Does that make any sense, everybody? So you just got to take it point by point and say, all right, what's going on here? Well, the slope is this. Hmm, how could that have happened? And like on that one horizontal those two horizontal ones, it could be two ways. Either everything is wide open and you got 10 coming in and 10 going out, or you got everything shut and nothing's happening. <coughs> Did they ever say that like the intake pipe is always open? No, they never did. So then there's a couple scenarios for some of these. All right. We should probably get going here. And I want to get out of this one. I should probably save it. Save that picture. And now we want to go back to Okay, today is all about shifts, and this is actually what, uh, what, some of the questions from Michelle and Trish, Trisha, right? Okay. Yeah, what Michelle and Trisha specifically were asking me was about, hey, what happens to this graph? I maybe jumped the gun when I explained it, but that's really what this lesson's all about. How do you take these standard library functions and kind of move them around? That's what this is about. And I've already given you some of the guidelines that jumped the gun on them. So here's the first one. What happens if you just tack on, like here, a plus 3? Well, when it comes outside the function, after the normal squaring operation, it just means literally jack it up for units. So it's like, you know, coming in with a crane and going, all right, bring her in. All right, she's hooked up. Yeah, take her away, three units. <laughs> Basically what's going on. Okay, you're just jacking it up. Yeah, you won't see the textbook say that. They call it a vertical shift. Okay. So now you know you got a blue collar algebra teacher here. I guess that's obvious. It is blue, isn't it? All right. <laughs> Whoa. You know, I didn't plan that. So anyway, this is just showing that um, what happens, do you think, if we have a negative? Well, then instead of being jacked up, it's literally being shoved downward. But it's the same thing. So you just li literally have this vertical shifting taking place. So now, what's the, uh, I know this is too general because I don't have a grid up here, but if you saw this, what, which one from the library uh, from last time does this look like? It looks like the absolute value. You, you now not only know this one, but what would happen if you had this move down to you know, below the origin? Well, now this is the absolute value of x minus 2. Uh, what if you have one jacked up 30 units? Absolute value of x 
plus 30. And so not only do you know one library function now, you just now know, now you know an infinite number of them. And we're going to even do more. We're now going to take this down and go left and right, too. And so we're actually taking your library of functions and we're making your library bigger than the Library of Congress. Okay? It's really cool because we're just multiplying all the places. Um, so yeah, and here's that one I was just talking about, absolute value. So all it is is the same thing, and it's pretty easy to identify. Again, it's that outside thing, that tacking on of a plus 3 or a minus 4. And, of course, can this happen with curves, too? Yeah, same thing. Now, let's talk about horizontal shifts. And I was speaking about this with Michelle. So now, inside the function, in function notation, inside the parentheses, if you see a minus or a plus, that's telling you you have a horizontal shift. And we have this little opposite effect. If it's minus C, it's actually going to cause a shift to the right. If it's plus C, it's actually going to cause a shift to the left. I'm not sure this shows that very well. I don't, I don't like this graphic, but if you look down here, if the blue is the original, then if you do this x minus c in red, what's going to happen? The red curve is literally shifted c units to the right. And if you do a plus c in parentheses, it's going to be c units shifted to the left. So that should make sense. It's the same kind of thing Michelle was asking me about before. I guess I could have warned you, too, that we were going to be talking about shifty curves today. You probably don't use that term shifty anymore, right? Mm, maybe. Okay, here's another one. Um, if the blue curve is y equals x cubed, then what's x cubed? I mean, x minus 2 cubed. But it's the same curve, shove 2 units to the right. And what is x plus 4 cubed? It's the same curve shoved 4 units to the left. And by the way, I know you can't see it, but if you look closely, each line here indicates 2 on this graph. Do you see that? So if you're wondering, how can the second notch be 4? Because each line stands for 2. It's not totally clear. Does that make sense then? That this curve would be 4 units shifted to the left? This one would be two units shifted to the right. So, shifted to the left, shifted to the right, stand, stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. Just thought I'd get that in there. Yeah, too much cough medicine. Okay. So, then uh, eventually what's going to happen is we're going to get... I mean, we're, gonna, we're not there yet, but eventually what's going to happen is can we have vertical and horizontal shifts on the same problem? Yeah. Okay, here's one. It says graph this function. Now, hopefully you look at this and go, you know what? This looks an awful lot like one of those library functions, doesn't it? Sure, this is that good old y equals the square root of x. You remember it looked like this from the library? All, but the only difference with this one in the library that starts at the origin is mine is shifted five units to the left and down four. So instead of my original, which looks like this, now I'm going to go five left and four down. And then I'm going to have the same curve. So it's just literally the same curve moved to the left 5 and down 4. 
And do you see how we're just getting really good mileage out of the library function? And we're able to use it in so many different ways. That's the idea here. Okay, so let's see. We we're on topic one was jacking up and shoving down, vertical shifting. Topic two was horizontal shifting. Topic three is we can also do what we call stretching and shrinking. And that happens by putting a multiple out in front. So the blue curve is good old x squared. What does 2x squared look like? Well, it literally gets stretched vertically. You can think of it as a rubberized uh, curve that you could just literally hold on to on the bottom and like stretch up. And hence, it gets a little bit skinnier and it gets tall. <coughs> and what happens when, when you put a like a fraction in front? Well, now it just like gets squished, and you see the green or whatever color that is, that grayish curve is more. Well, when you squish it, of course, it's going to widen out. So a number as a coefficient in front of the function will cause, a, you know, above 1 will cause it to be stretched. Below 1 will cause it to be vertically, I guess you could say, shrunk or squished. Okay, here's another example. Oh, this is, uh, excuse me, this is uh, horizontal stretching and shrinking. Okay, now what happens? Well, let's take a look at the good old, the blue curve is the familiar one from the library. Y equals the absolute value of X. So what happens when you stick an, a 2 inside the function? Not outside, but inside. It actually causes it to be stretched out more. And what happens when you stick a one-half in the inside? It causes it to be squished. So it didn't seem to have a whole lot of change versus this, did it? Same, same deal it was... Yes, go ahead. Well, squished horizontal. Yeah, I know what I what I, I not really because I was talking about squishing vertically, but I shouldn't have been because this is uh, this is if I look at the title on the page, I should have been talking horizontal because that's what this is all about. Yeah, it's horizontally squished. So if we stick with the old paradigm here, when you're inside, then what? It causes things to happen horizontally. When you do things outside, it affects the vertical. Likewise here, if we put a 2 in the inside of our function, which in this case is absolute value, it causes a horizontal squishing. And on the previous slide, if it was outside, then it caused it to be vertically stretched. So putting this all together, let me just, uh, I'm, I'm trying to bring these rules back into play here. When things are outside of the function, that's going to be a vertical, and it's going to stay true to form. If it's a plus, it'll go up. If it's a minus, it'll go down. When you stick it inside the function itself, then it's a horizontal thing, and it kind of works in opposite motion, right? A plus meant to the left, and a minus meant to the right. Okay, now with coefficients, same deal. When the number was to the outside, as it was in this slide, we're talking in vertical motion. Higher, stretch, lower, squish. But when it's in the inside, now it's right away horizontal again, and just the opposite. Higher, squish, lower, stretch. So that's, I think we got it all together now. So 
Outside function, vertical. Inside function, horizontal, opposite. This just shows a uh, good old cubic function along with 10 times and 1 tenth. Now, is that inside or outside the function, the 1 tenth? It's outside because the function is x cubed. Is the 1 tenth inside? Yeah, it's definitely outside. So this is a vertical guy. And therefore, the higher the number, the more stretched out it's going to be vertically. And so notice 10x cubed, you can barely see it. It's a series of dots here. Whereas regular x cubed is this one. And then 1 tenth is going to be squished. And sure enough, it's the wider, chubbier one. <coughs> So now we throw a bunch of things together. What's going on here? So let's just take a look at this one right up here. Hopefully now you're going to look at this and go, you know, that's just nothing more than a cubic function. I know what a cubic function is. That's one in my library that goes like this. But this one is, move to the left one, moved up three, and squish vertically. You see how you can put them all together? You can actually tell quite a bit about a graph I mean, before you even do any graph. Well, let's just see how they did that. So they took the original graph, sure enough, what did they do? They moved it to the left one, then they moved it up three, and then where did they squish it? I don't know. They got step one. I guess they did it. Oh, I guess they did it on the same graph. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's pretty much it. Uh, let's just go over these again. We got our library. When we have something that's done to the function, but outside of it. Then it's a vertical motion. If it's addition, up. If it's subtraction, down. If it's multiplication, stretch. If it's uh, by a number, well, one it's a number over one. If it's a number less than one, squish. Inside is horizontal motion, opposite. So if it's inside and it's a subtraction, it shifts it to the right. If it's an addition, shift it to the left. If it's a multiplication, it's squished horizontally, a number bigger than one. And if it's a number smaller than one, it's stretched horizontally. And then there's combinations of those. That's really what this is all about. So this is like 2, 4, only uh, kind of extended today. So let's just take a look and see what the assignment looks like here. It's just really all about the shifting. Oh yeah, and then there I see a do a few of the uh, what piecewise functions in number four. They aren't going to throw us off now. We just have to look at which piece to use. As in your question earlier, Liz. But now you got it, right? Okay, that happens. I'm glad we got it straightened out. Oh, they're going to have you do some a little bit of all of this stuff. They got all these exercises. I don't think we really. It doesn't look like anything is tricky here. When you get to number 19. Um, instead of graphing or anything, it just says describe the transformation from a common function that occurs. So, oh, you know, we, I forgot to talk about one thing. What happens if you just take a whole function and negate it? So, like, go from x squared to minus x squared. You know that it flips it vertically, right? We haven't talked about upside down. 
So when I look at number 19, describe the transformation. You could think of that as negative x squared plus 12. So what is that? It's good old x squared from our library. Flipped upside down. And then shoved up, jacked up 12. So now instead of an upright parabola, this is going to be an inverted one. The top of the parabola will be, instead of at the origin, it will be at 0, 12. Uh, how about... Um, Number 25. Describe that one for me. What's the transformation? First of all, which function are we beginning with? <coughs> Cubic function, right? This one. And what happens to it? First, it is moved one to the right. Then it is jacked up to it. So it's just a typical library function. Shove to the right one and up two. Isn't that cool? You can see that just by looking at it. You start sounding really knowledgeable. You know, you get in a crowd and go, oh man, yeah, let's just say a cubic function. Move to the right one and up two. You're impressive. So, let's do... Uh, Guess let's do the every other odd thing with 61. Yeah, every other odd with 61 or its nearest number. You know, it might be 59, I'm not sure. And we're done a little early. Do what? Yes. Oh, yeah. How many of you are supposed to go to this presentation tomorrow? So, what, the rest of you are not, what is that, a freshman thing? Yeah. So the rest of you aren't freshmen, is that what that amounts to? Or you're in foundation, but you're supposed to go, but you're The people that, is my right, the people who didn't raise their hand are not in foundation? Are you in foundations? Oh, so one is optional, the other you have to. So how many of you have to go? So to do what? Well, just just everybody. Just wait a second here. Yeah, because on uh, Tuesdays we meet at a different time. It's at eleven thirty. So your advisor told you to come to class. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have enough information. From I'm a little confused. I'll tell you what, um, I will talk to the foundation. Talk to the college one. College one and I will. I'll, I'll send all of you an email about this. Okay. So as of right now, we'll meet. But I got. I got to learn more. Plan on class. <laughs>